Welcome to Truth For Life. Today, on Good Friday, Christians all around the world are pausing to remember the incredibly loving sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. But the cross would have no power or purpose if it weren't for the resurrection. And so Alistair Begg is leading us through a study of Easter morning drawn from the Apostle John's account in chapter 20 of John's Gospel. Not that little phrase, the other disciple, is how John describes himself. It seems sort of quite self-deprecating, doesn't it? You know, he doesn't say, and uh, John, you know, because it's me, it's my— but, but, you know, I've been reading this all week, and, and I don't know whether there's any, any validity in what I'm going to point out to you, but, but I'll point it out to you anyway. She, she explains to them uh, what, what she assumes— that somebody has taken Jesus out of the tomb. They, whoever they is, uh, they are, have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we we don't know where they have laid him. So, having explained that, and one of the other gospel writers, you will remember, uh, says that the initial reaction on the part of Peter and the others was to say, frankly, you're out of your mind. Uh, You know, something's, something's wrong with you. But she's able to convince them, enough that they would set out running. So there in verse 3, so Peter went out, notice, with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So for whatever reason, John wants us to know that he can run faster than Peter. (laughs) That Peter set off first, but John beat him. For those of you who like to do, you know, 100-yard sprints, there's a little intrigue in here. And so uh, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And uh, we're told in just three verbs that he stooped, he looked in, and he saw. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter catches him up, and he goes straight into the tomb, and his observation confirms the fact of the linen cloths, the grave clothes, lying there, and the separation of the face cloth, which had been on the head of Jesus, and so on. The details of it are mysterious. The fact of it is undeniable. And we are told that it is this which gives rise to the fledgling faith of John. Then the other disciple, verse 8, who had reached the tomb first— You already told us that, John, but apparently it's very important to you. (laughs) Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, got you, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. So John's faith is grounded in what he sees and in what he does not see. He's honest enough to tell us that at that point he had not put two and two together— In the writing of the gospel now, I know what I didn't know then on that day, much in the same way as you have at the end of Luke's gospel. Remember where Jesus says to the disconsolate disciples, how how, uh, slow you are to believe all that the prophets have written. It's quite remarkable, isn't it, that Jesus explained this to them on multiple occasions, but they still did not understand the Scriptures. Well, the tomb is empty— And so the disciples went back to their homes. And every boy under the age of 12 is saying, and that's what I'm looking forward to as well, Pastor Ben. (laughs) That's fine. And uh, so we will go back to our homes. In what state regarding faith and belief? That's the question. You see, when Paul mentions the resurrection at the end of his address in Acts chapter 17, when he's speaking to uh, the, the thinking population of Athens. When he gets to the issue of the resurrection, we're told that the response was threefold. Immediately, some people mocked. Some people then said, well, perhaps you could give another talk on this sometime. We'd like to think about it. And some people believed. Now, let me take those three responses, frame them briefly, and Ask you to ask yourself, into which category do I fall? That is, into which category do you fall? I know which category in which I fall. 
So response number one, instead of saying they mocked him, we're going we're to call uh, response number one, would you believe it? Would you believe it? When I came to America in 1983 and made all sorts of new friends, I made a friend of an older man, and this was one of his cliches. He used to say it all the time in a, in a very sort of Cleveland voice. Would you believe it? You know. <laughs> would you believe it? He used to say. I didn't know whether I was supposed to believe it or not believe it. I didn't know what he meant. Would you believe it? I think he meant, you're not supposed to believe it, but I didn't know. So sometimes I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, no, you shouldn't. I said, no, I don't. I don't believe it. No, of course not. But he had me upside down. Would you believe it? It was a, it was a way of saying, nobody in his right mind believes this. It's, it, it, it's the response of incredulity, if you like. It's the response of skepticism. It's the response probably of some of you to this point in your life. You find yourself saying, would you believe it? I, I think I've got myself in a room where people actually believe in the physical, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the grave. Yes, you have. Well, what would you have as an alternative? Some of the suggestions that are offered up, trotted out every year, the same stories. Uh, it was the, the reason that the, that the tomb was empty was because, they say, the ladies went to the wrong tomb. Must have been a man who wrote that. <laughs> that is sexist. That is politically incorrect. That is the caricature. My wife could get lost in an elevator. That kind of thing, right? I didn't say she could. It's the, it's the description. But you get the point. Give the woman some credit, please. And if, for example, they did show up at the wrong tomb, then they could have gone to Joseph and said, hey, we were clearly at the wrong tomb. Where exactly is that new tomb? Some say he was stolen by his enemies. No motive. All they wanted was a body so that they could produce the body in Jerusalem and say, look, his folks are telling lies. He's alive. He's dead. He's as dead as a doornail. Some want to suggest that Jesus was stolen by his friends. In fact, the authorities were concerned about that. They said, we want to put a guard over this tomb in case his friends come and steal him away and make people believe that he's actually alive, even though he's really dead. Well, they, they didn't understand his friends, because his friends weren't about going to steal the body. And, and, and incidentally, what a job they must have done of it. Uh, 75 pounds of spices in, in wrapping the body with all of these cloths. And for whatever reason, they decided, what we'll do is we'll just unwind them all, and we'll disengage it all. And then, and then we'll put them all back, as if you say to yourself, would you believe it? <laughs> would you? Some apparently do. Let me tell you why. Because you so desperately want any kind of explanation that leaves you of the responsibility of considering the possibility that Jesus Christ is the very person that he claimed to be, that he is alive, and that you're going to reckon with him. It's like Aldous Huxley when he says, I had a reason for my atheism. I decided I did not want to believe in God, because it proved to be, for me, a, a freedom both sexually and politically, accountable to no God. Therefore, I can believe and do as I please. Would you believe it? Response number two, the pondering response, not the incredulous response. You sit to yourself for a moment, can I believe this? Can I believe this? This is the response, if you like, of personal inquiry, of thinking, examining, pondering. In other words, it is a response which takes the Bible seriously, which realizes that in the reading of the Bible, it's not a call to some emotional search, but it's a call to consider what is placed there. In fact, what happens when we start to really read the Bible uh, with an eye of uh, incipient faith is that we might find ourselves saying, as Pilate eventually said, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? You remember he says that? 
I can find nothing wrong with this man, he says. You keep coming here with all these charges against him. I'm going to wash my hands of the whole affair, but what do you want me to do with Jesus? The anointed one, the Messiah of God. What will I do with Jesus? Well, there's the question, isn't it? What are you going to do with Jesus? You see, we ought not to think that somehow or another we can look into ourselves, into the, into the, um, uh, the treasure chest of our existence, and, uh, and push aside, as it were, unbelief, and, and take off the shelf belief. Oh, yeah, this is a sort of transaction. God, you do your part, and, and, and I will do my part. Here's, here's the real deal. We can't. You see, the answer to the question, can I believe, is first of all, no. Why? Because the Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and in our sins. So the only way a man or a woman ever comes to believe is a result of the quickening work of the Holy Spirit. I have to be quickened before I can believe. The faith with which I believe and trust— is only mine because God has created it within my heart. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it will make perfect sense to you. You say to yourself, why is it that I could have come to this church so many times, sit right in the same place with the same person, and this person believes hearing the exact same thing, and I do not? Can I believe it? The last response, I do believe it. Or better still, I believe him. Later in this chapter, John records for us the encounter between Jesus and Thomas. And some of us perhaps are a lot like Thomas. We say to ourselves, of all the followers of Jesus with whom I identify, I think I'm mostly like Thomas. I'm not going to believe, he said, unless I can do this. And Jesus says, well, then, fine. Put your finger here. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? The answer to that is really yes. Then he says, listen, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. When Peter writes to the scattered believers of his day, he says this to them, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, for us this morning, it is not that faith comes by sight, but that faith comes by what is heard, or, if you like, by what is read. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. Through the Word of Christ. Well, you can hear my Word right now. I could preach to you till my lungs gave out, and still you would never believe, unless you hear the Word of Christ. You say, well, what what do you mean by that? You're talking about something spooky? No, not spooky. Something supernatural? Definitely. You remember when Nicodemus, in, back in chapter 3, comes to Jesus, and, he's, and, he, and he has these inquiries about Jesus. You're, you're a teacher sent from God because no one would ever do the things you've been able to do. Jesus cuts to the chase, and he says, you know, you need a, you need a heart transplant, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. If you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of God, and you can't enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, of course, answers in a a very physical way, and Jesus explains to him, listen, we're not talking in physical terms. We're talking in spiritual terms. And then he says to him, he says, you know what, Nicodemus? The wind blows where where it wills, and we can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to. And then he says, such is everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, this is a profound mystery. John's emphasis is not simply on believing that what Jesus said is true, but actually trusting him as a personal Savior. 
You see, it is the Spirit of God that brings God's Word to our hearts. Again, and this is still in John's Gospel, uh, earlier in 16, when Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he's going to go away, and when he goes away, the Holy Spirit will come. And he says, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of the meaning of sin. He will convict the wor- he convince the world of the nature of goodness and of the significance of judgment. He will expose their sin, he says, because they do not believe in me. Now, you think about that for just a moment. There is no doubt that unbelief is the great sin. But surely Jesus is saying something at least along with that. He will expose their sin because they do not believe in me. Because the only way they will come to believe in me is to believe in me as I am, namely a Savior. And if they are not aware of their sin, then there is no reason for them to have a Savior. And that, you see, is largely where our congregation is Sunday by Sunday. All these lovely people, friends and neighbors in this great city of Cleveland, living our lives every day, as if somehow or another a good God, if he exists, will reward nice people like us if we just do our best. When in actual fact, the story of the Bible is something vastly different. It's mercy on the part of God. It's grace on the part of God to convict us of our sin. I was thinking about it just in between the services. I was thinking about my, my urologist way back in 2004 and five and six, and how one morning he called me up in seven, and he says, you know, Alistair, I'm going to retire, and I, I, I want you to come in and see me, and I want to biopsy you, because I don't want to retire and discover that I missed cancer in you. Therefore, let me biopsy you. My immediate response was, does it hurt? (laughs) He said, I won't hurt you. Well, what a mercy it was. That was 2007. Ironically, my urologist died of prostate cancer a few years ago. I thought about it. I said, he saved others, but himself he could not save. That's Jesus. Come down from the cross if you are the Christ. Why are you staying up there? Because I love you. Because in eternity past, along with the Father and the Spirit, we determined that this should be the case. It is God's Spirit that brings home to us God's Word to show us what we are. You see, on your own, on our own this morning, any one of us is able to make these sort of deductions and uh, expressions. You find people saying, you know, I'm I'm really fed up with things the way they are, or uh, I have failed to reach my goals, or I have let myself down and I've let others down. And you get this superficial Easter story which goes, well, that's nice you would mention that. But here's the good news. Jesus gives hope, and have a great day, and get a daffodil on the way out the door, all right? You walk out the door and say, that's the biggest chronicle of despair I have ever heard. The story of Jesus is not the story of him becoming your life coach. It is the story of Jesus becoming your Savior. That's why he convicts of sin. We sin by thinking, wanting, and doing what displeases God. Our sin deserves to be punished. Only someone who doesn't deserve to be punished can take our place. And the Lord Jesus was prepared to suffer and die so that we could be saved from our sins. It was his love for me that nailed him to the tree to die in agony for all my sin. Would you believe it? Can I believe it? 
I believe it. There's only one way to become a Christian. Did you know that? You don't become a Christian by having somebody do something for you. You don't become a Christian as a result of some religious exercise on the outside. To become a Christian means to trust in Jesus as our Savior, to acknowledge that we need him because we're sinful, to acknowledge that we can't save ourselves, to acknowledge that we don't deserve his love nor salvation, but that he loves us and promises to save everyone who trusts in him. Perhaps today you'll be part of that company. You're listening to Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, with a message titled, He Saw and Believed. Please keep listening. Alistair will lead us in a prayer of response in just a minute. Before we pray, we want to take a few minutes to tell you about a wonderful resource our team has selected to help us as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, Sunday school teachers, to help us pass the gospel on to the next generation. We're talking about a hardcover picture book titled The Garden, The Curtain, and The Cross. It's a book that skillfully takes young children through the story of salvation. Beginning with God's perfect garden, the words and pictures work together to explain how sin entered the world, the meaning of the curtain in the temple, and how renewed fellowship with God is possible through the cross. The Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross is the perfect Easter book for young people you know. It makes a great gift as well. We'll send you a copy along with our thanks when you donate to support this ministry. Give online at truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888 888- Five eight eight seven eight eight four. Don't forget to mention the picture book, The Garden, The Curtain, and The Cross. If you'd rather mail your gift along with your request for the book, our address is Truth for Life, P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. Now here's a final thought from Alistair. We're all going to leave in a moment or two, and we scatter, and so many uh, things can take our minds away. Let me say to you that if you are in that center category, I need to consider this. Please read the Bible. See what God will say to you. And if you're sitting here saying, well, I actually do believe. I I want to believe. What, uh, what, What shall I say? Well, let me suggest to you something along these lines, just from where you sit and in your heart, will be sufficient. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I'm a guilty, lost, helpless sinner. I want you to save me, to take your rightful place as Lord of my life. I want to trust in your blood shed for sinners. And I'm coming to you just as I am. Nothing to plead in my defense. Please take me and make me all that you want me to be. Amen. And if you've just prayed that prayer and would like to learn more about following Jesus, we've produced a short video that will be helpful. It's available at truthforlife.org slash the story, and we want to strongly encourage you to take a look. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us at Truth For Life. We are headed into a unique Easter weekend. For many of us, our local church families will not be gathering together this weekend, so I'd like to warmly invite you to watch a special presentation live with Alistair today in memory of Good Friday, and then again Sunday in the celebration of Christ's resurrection. To check the live stream event times, visit truthforlife.org slash live. We sincerely hope you can join us. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. where the learning is for living.